Hello, welcome to the Submarine Force Museum. I'm Commander Brad Boyd, Director of the Museum and Officer in Charge of Historic Ship Nautilus. Today I'm going to be answering some questions about uh, submarine hull design and progression throughout the years. So, as you can see behind me, we have a model wall, and every one of these models is 1 8 inch to 1 foot in real life. So the model is 1 8 inch, real life submarine would be 1 foot in representation. Um, and all of them being to the same scale, you can see the size change over time. You also could see the hull shapes, and I'll be talking through the major changes that happened uh, with, with the progression throughout all the classes. So, uh, I hope you enjoyed today's tour. Uh, I'm going to pause for a second now and actually open the model wall case up behind me so that uh, we don't get all the glare with the camera, and then I'll be getting uh, a little bit closer up and uh, so you can see the models in a little bit better detail. So, hold on a second, and uh, we'll continue on. All right, so we got the glass open. Uh, coming on in, we're going to start off with uh, the Holland. She is 53 feet and 10 inches long and 10 foot and 4 inches in diameter um, and was uh, acquired in 1900, April 11th, 1900, the birthday of the submarine force. So she's the first boat and then the, over the next 12 years we go through uh, the plunger class uh, which is basically the hauling class but as a class as well as the Bravo or the B and C class. Not much changes other than a little bit of streamlining of the hull um, and lengthening of the hull, as you can kind of see here uh, with cuttlefish. Um, and we increased repeated tube capacity from about one to three. But that was really about all the changes that happened. Not, not much else happened as we tried to figure out how best to use this new uh, platform for, for weapons. Um, then you get to the D and E class. Now these were massive jumps. They increased range past 1,000 nautical miles. In fact, the E class improved past 2,000 nautical miles. And that's what you're looking at here is the E class. Um, and we started to play with diesel engines. Prior to this, it was all gasoline engines. Now, they weren't figured out yet, but we started to use them. Um, and then after, oh, and E-Class, by the way, was the first submarine, uh, the, the smallest submarine, to be able to cross the Atlantic under her own power. Um, all the rest had to be towed across to Ireland, which is where the submarines were based out of uh, during World War I. So, um, submarines continue to get better with the F, G, H and K class, so we have a G class here, um, and then you have a K class down here, which unfortunately the model is uh, uh, being refurbished because it got damaged when we were trying to install it into the new model wall here. Um, but that's the shape of the K class for you. Um, but anyway, so the G class, as you can see here, uh, not too much in technical innovation between them, other than we're increasing size, and by increasing size, we're able to increase uh, range. Um, and then we're also, because it can uh, incre uh, hold more fuel. And we also see the first deck guns on the L-class boat, which unfortunately I don't have a model of. Prior to this, it was only torpedoes. Um, during World War I, we quickly realized that you can see the relative small uh, size of the sail compared to the submarine. The sail, the, uh, the, the, the conning tower right there. So we realized that in World War I, we're going to spend a lot of time on the surface in the Atlantic, and that's not really a desirable situation to have such a small sail as you try to drive from the bridge, which is up at the top. So we increased it with the O-class, um, which you see right here, uh, as well as the R-class and the S-class. Um, these were the O-class and the R-class were commissioned in 1918. S-class, while designed and built during World War I, wasn't commissioned until 1919. Um, these are also kind of the first mass-produced submarines that we made. So the O-class had 16 submarines in that class. Prior to this, num the largest number was 11. And then the R-class had uh, uh, 20 in her class, and the S-class had 51. So, okay. Now hold on a second, I apologize. We're gonna, I'm gonna give you some best angles as I can, but the next pane of glass doesn't remove, so I'm gonna be shooting from one side and then another. So after World War I, we took the German U-boats uh, and uh, backwards engineered them uh, to dramatically improve our own, and we started building the V-class boats, which is really five different classes of one to three boats per class um, that worked toward a fleet boat concept, which was a submarine that could keep up with the fleet. It was fast enough on the surface to keep up. Um, not much other than increased size, and we started playing with reliability of the engines uh, and, and everything else. No, no amazing things out of it other than cuttlefish, we switched from an all rivet to an all weld construction, uh, and that was a major change for us because uh, now you can increase diving depth. 
Now there are a bunch of iterative steps between this, but eventually the fleet boat concept was realized and uh, was mass produced with the Gato class. So you can see that here with USS Flasher, um, which was, uh, had the deck gun that we've, that we've looked at. Uh, but the Flasher and the Gato class had a few things that needed to come together to make this fleet boat concept really work. That was the all welded construction, which we talked about, which allowed depth, operating depths greater than 200 feet. Another was a successful diesel electric drive, allowing for the engine to drive either shaft or charge the batteries. Um, this greatly improved the maintenance capability as well, because you, know, you could have three engines shut down operating two shafts, um, so you can do maintenance on those three while one of them's up and running and no issues. Um, it also uh, uh, improved uh, maneuverability as the diesel was not directly connected to the shaft. You didn't have to have a reversing gear or you would, or have to uncouple, recouple the engines just to turn the propellers in the opposite direction. Uh, the last thing was improved was torpedo inventory and tubes. So we shifted to 10 torpedo tubes, six forward, four aft, and were able to carry, increase the capacity to 24 torpedoes. The Baleo class, which you can see right here, um, was basically a Gato class that had uh, increased hull thickness um, so she could go even deeper uh, by another 100 feet. It's extremely useful in trying to evade depth charges. Clamagor that you see right here was the first submarine we ever made that had a snorkel device. So she could raise a mast to bring air into the boat and run the diesel engine while it periscoped depth. So that was a huge uh, technological change and advantage for us as well. So. All right, so next we're gonna shift over to uh, um, post-World War II submarines, and give me a second because I gotta shift to another side of the glass. Following World War II, the submarine attack role needed to expand to be able to hunt other submarines, um, specifically uh, the Type 21 German U-boat that both us and the Russians obtained at about the same time, and we were afraid of having mass Type 21 U-boats being launched by the Soviets, and so we wanted to come up with a boat to be a hunter-killer for other submarines, and we came up with the K-1 here. Uh, unfortunately, it was quickly realized that a diesel submarine is not the best platform to hunt another diesel submarine because you're slower underwater um, and you need to have sustained high speeds to effectively do uh, a submarine uh, on submarine engagement. Um, so K-1, we only had about three boats of her and the next major step was Nautilus. Now, she's a Type 21 German U-boat that was fitted out with a nuclear reactor and a World War I destroyer's engine room. But the exterior design was still that of a diesel boat. You notice it still comes down to a point in the front, it, more knife edges on the bottom. It, it's a little bit of artist um, uh, liberty taken with this. It's not quite as round on Nautilus's bottom. It's, it's a little more pointed. Um, and this improves surface handling, but it sacrificed submerged performance. Now, at the same time that Nautilus was being constructed, the search was on for uh, how to maximize underwater speeds. This was accomplished with the albacore hull, which you see right here, which is the teardrop hull that we use today. Um, she was not very stable on the surface as there's no V-shape, so submarines even today rock and roll on the surface a lot more than they used to uh, pound for pound um, because the hull is a rounded bottom. However, she's a lot more streamlined. And so she's had, she sacrifices surface performance for submerged per performance. She's much faster underwater, reaching speeds in excess of 25 knots, and greatly reduces the, uh, the flow noise over the hull, um, which improves uh, sonar ranges because you're not trying to hear through your own um, uh, sound, as well as uh, uh, reduces uh, the detection ranges of the boat because you're not making as much noise. So. Uh, and we'll skip skipjack for a second and come back up here. So at the same time that we're developing the Hunter Killer, we also wanted to be able to launch missiles. Um, and so that was the Grayback uh, that you see here. And so she was a large diesel boat submarine that had this, you know, bulbous thing you see right here. So it's a giant hatch that she could store uh, two Regulus 1 missiles or one Regulus 2 missile. Um, and she could surface and roll the missile out and launch. Um, this is a great advantage and that you could position the missile without any warning for the enemy by using a submarine. The disadvantage is you have to surface and make yourself vulnerable. Uh, so we didn't do this for very long. We wanted to work for, towards the uh, ballistic missile uh, launch for the submarine, and we'll get to that in a little bit. So, all right. 
Now, so with the success of Nautilus that we talked about and Albacore down below, we married the nuclear reactor and the teardrop hull and came up with the skipjack class. Uh, so you notice the rounded hull, as I said, she's married with the reactor. So now she's got unlimited uh, underwater performance in terms of propulsion and was able to stay down for weeks at a time. And then when you tie it in the uh, oxygen generator later on, so she can create her own oxygen, uh, she's actually able to stay under for months at a time. Okay, I'm gonna pause again for a second as we jump uh, to the next section over here. All right, so we're back on, and uh, next is Tullaby. So the skipjack class, the next major step was moving the torpedo tubes. So you can see the doors here. So instead of having them in the bow, they got moved to amidships. And what this did was it allowed putting a spherical array, a new sonar array into the bow, which greatly improved sonar performance um, by removing as much of the ship as possible from in front of the sonar sphere, reducing the own ship's noise so you can have better detection ranges. It also reduces the amount of ship that the sonar has to see through. It's not trying to see through the hull to then see, um, excuse me, it's not trying to see through the hull to then see the uh, 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 ocean around it as it tried to look down or sideways um, by putting it just at the very front of the boat. So that was Tullaby. And then the next we have is Thresher uh, or Permit class. So with the loss of the Thresher, the lead boat, uh, by naval tradition, you rename the class. So it started off Thresher, it then became Permit upon loss of Thresher. Um, Thresher improved the uh, layout and equipment mounting in the engine room. The so loud equipment like turbine generators were placed on sort of a raft to help absorb the sound instead of transmitting it into the water. Um, and then, so with the loss of Thresher, the Navy came up with the SubSafe program. And that was first used and, uh, on the Sturgeon class. So hold on a second while I shift to the other glass panel. Back again, so uh, Sturgeon class, so you can see that up here. So she was the first boat designed with submarine safe. So after the loss of the Thresher, uh, the Navy did a complete overhaul on how we uh, designed submarines and, read and overlooked everything that had to do with submarine um, uh, survival uh, to include things like uh, escape and, uh, uh, and hull integrity. So they looked at absolutely every component that'd be tied into it, anything that penetrates the hull. So hatches, torpedo tubes, mass, hull valves, everything got overhauled, they minimized as much as they could, um, and then they put a bunch of redundant systems in place. And Sturgeon, uh, the Sturgeon class was the first one designed originally with subsafe instead of being uh, backfitted. So that's Sturgeon class. And then we're gonna move to uh, the Los Angeles class and the uh, uh, Virginia class and the, and the Seawolf class, the boats we have in, uh, in service today. So here's the Los Angeles class. Um, the second flight actually uh, shifted the, uh, uh, or gained the ability to launch vertical launch uh, missiles. So you would have uh, the four torpedo tubes in the bow and then 12 more missiles uh, on top. Uh, and then or 12 tubes on top capable of carrying tomahawks. Um, and then the improved class would actually take these uh, planes that you see right there called Fairwater planes because they're on the sail and moved it to the bow. Um, and so bow planes. And they also reinforced the sail so that she could actually surface through. The Sturgeon class from before had the ability to surface through. She had a hardened sail and could rotate the uh, uh, Fairwater planes 90 degrees to surface through. We removed the surfacing capability with Los Angeles. We didn't think we needed it anymore for the first flight and the second flight. And then realized we wanted to maintain that capability and with the improved class, uh, reinforce the sail, move the planes so that we, uh, we could do that. Then you have the Seawolf class. Seawolf designed as the ultimate hunter killer. Um, she could carry 50 torpedoes. She had eight torpedo tubes, and you can kind of see the uh, four doors on this side over here. So she had eight torpedo tubes. Um, greatly improved sonar capability, greatly improved, improved speed. Uh, the torpedo room was completely automated, uh, but she cost a lot. And with the end of the Cold War, we wanted our peace dividend, and so we wanted to uh, uh, not build as many. So we only built three of the Seawolf class. And so we switched to Virginia class, which took a lot of the lessons learned of the Seawolf, but didn't take it to the extreme max that Seawolf is in some cases, and also made it more capable in the littoral waters or shallow waters. And so that's uh, uh, the Virginia class here. Um, and there's multiple versions of her. Uh, some have, all of them have a vertical launch of some capacity. Some are either just torpedo, uh, excuse me, torpedo, uh, uh, tomahawks. And then we're also the Virginia payload module, uh, which uh, is a giant tube, two of them in the front end, 
that can handle uh, multiple uh, tomahawks or whatever else we choose to put into it. And that's the uh, Virginia class. Also with the Virginia class and Seawolf class, uh, you'll see the end here. It's not the typical propeller from before. It's an impulsor. Um, so it's basically like an underwater jet. And that's uh, uh, the propulsion for uh, Virginia class, Seawolf class, which again, reduces a lot of noise uh, instead of having to have the, uh, the propeller out there. So, all right, now we're gonna switch back for a second. Um, so bear with me as we go to the uh, ballistic missile submarines. All right, now the first ballistic missile submarine was the George Washington. Um, she was a skipjack class submarine slated to be the Scorpion. Uh, but once we got the uh, ballistic missile part figured out, we cut her in half, put in a missile compartment that you see here, the 16 tubes put her back together, renamed her the George Washington, and she was the first of what we call the 41 for Freedom, or the 41 ballistic missile submarines. There are actually multiple classes within this group. Um, as you can see, as one right here, and then, uh, hold on a second, come back over, and see why I was trying to cut out the glare there. Um, then you've got the Lafayette here, Um, and there's multiple classes within there. All of them are just iterative steps, slightly bigger designed for the Polaris A1, A2, A3, Poseidon C3 uh, uh, missiles. Uh, and then uh, uh, the next big step after that was the Ohio class. So the Ohio class uh, replaced the 41 for Freedom. It's the largest submarine ever built by the United States at 560 feet long and 42 feet in diameter. But with the Strategic Arms Reduction uh, Treaty with Russia, the first four had to be disposed of. So we converted them from 24 tubes of, ball of ballistic missiles to 22 of the tubes were converted to carry up to seven Tomahawks each, for a max total of 154, and two of the tubes um, for employing special forces uh, by stowing their gear and connecting to a dry dock shelter topside uh, for the sealed delivery vehicle to be housed. So. All right, so as, as I said, or as we showed, uh, you can see the progression of submarines from 1900 through today. Um, we shifted from a more coastal defense force to long range diesel boats tied to the atmosphere for propulsion and breathing still to nuclear powered submarines uh, that could spend weeks or months submerged. Hope you enjoyed this quick snapshot uh, showing the progression of submarines for the past 220 years. If you have any questions, please let us know. But with that, bye.